VoiceOver Coffee Shop, Episode 8. Welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there. My name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to know more about me, feel free to visit my personal website at www.voicebard.com. In today's episode, we have my dear friend, Troy W. Hudson. With over 30 years in the industry, this all-American veteran artist has narrated over 60 audiobooks, e-learning modules, nationally broadcast commercials, and many more. Troy tells us how he's found his way through the industry by building strong relationships with every client he takes on. Hey, Troy, how are you doing? Andrew, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a kick to be on your program. Of it really course. is. It's great to have you here. That's a really nice introduction, by the way. I was like, always oh, talking about me. I, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> so, Troy, how do you take your coffee? Uh, you know, I, I, I can, I can go back and forth. I used to do the frou-frou flavored creamers. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I went to black and then I quit and did tea for a while. And now I'm doing just a little smidge of like a half and half non-flavored cream because I'm doing like a special diet and I'm not even supposed to be drinking coffee, but you know, I don't think right. it keeps us up for the late nights of recording and editing. Right. <laughs> yes. I've been known to, I don't burn the midnight oil like I used to, but yeah, it, it definitely gets you going in the morning when you got to do something uh, really fast. Yeah. So how did you go from, um, from the military to voiceover? What was, what was that transition? I know that's probably a long story, but, um, but <laughs> it's more like a long time ago. <laughs> well, kids, it goes all the way back to 1984. Um, yeah, I, I did active duty U.S. Army from 1984 to 1989, mm -hmm. um, signed up. Uh, my stepfather actually was my Army recruiter. I had no idea what I was going to do out of high school. I had the possibility of going to um, uh, college, but I, I really didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't know what I wanted to, to do. I, I, was, I was confused like many 18-year-olds can be. And so he suggested there was a school in the military uh, for radio, television, broadcast journalism. And I, that, I had no idea that existed in the military. And apparently all the branches had a, a variation of that. And so um, I had moved to Utah from Tennessee when I was 14. And three, four years later, the accent, I don't know if you can hear it now, but the accent that I had was really thick and country in Tennessee. <laughs> and when I moved to Utah, over the years, it, it just got, it kind of slowly got diluted a bit, unless, uh, unless I really just wasn't thinking about it. You know, when you're a kid, you want to fit in. So it had, it had kind of whittled away to the point to where it was manageable. So the, the military sent me this script uh, to audition with and send it back on, I don't know if you kids know what cassette tapes are, but way back when, <laughs> um, audio cassette was the way we would send stuff in. And so I had my little home recorder and I must have practiced that script 200 times trying to get it just right because I didn't know what they were looking for. Uh, and so I sent it off and it came back a couple of weeks later and they said I was approved to go to the school. And so it was a whirlwind of like four months of intensive in front of the camera stuff. I had no clue. I had no clue what I was. I actually had to get through basic training before I got there. So that was eight weeks of that before I got you know into the school. And uh, up in Fort Ben Harrison, Indiana, uh, in, in the Indianapolis area. And um, so when I graduated, the, the, the premium assignment, there were two assignments. If you went to Europe, uh, AF, AFN Europe, Armed Forces Network Europe, that was the premium assignment, Germany. If you went to Korea, AFKN, Korean Network, that was a plum assignment. And where did I go? I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> And any stateside assignment that at that point in time for an army broadcaster, it was just, it, it was, it was not good. It had no reflection on what you did in school. It was just this, you know, where they decided you, you know, this person goes to this assignment and it was just totally random. So I went there with nothing to do. Uh, 
but there were some very uh, kind and, and generous and understanding people in the command group who understood. I got assigned to a psychological operations group in the U.S. Army, uh, part of the special ops command there. And it, it, interesting assignment, but there was nothing for this particular job. There was nothing. My job didn't exist in that unit. They were going to build something later. But in the meantime, I'd gone through this school. I was ready to do my job. I was excited about radio TV broadcasting. And I get there and uh, a commander heard about me um, and found out that I needed some uh, work in that field. And they actually assigned me across post to the headquarters in a special duty assignment. And so I, 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 I lived with the unit I was with and I went to work across the post and did radio TV broadcasting. I had a morning radio show. I did radio production. I learned all these amazing things from these incredibly talented people, OJT basically after school. And then they put me in to a TV host position uh, alongside a female co-host. And it was like a news magazine program where we traveled all over the post. And it was a phenomenal thing. Uh, a couple of years later, the unit I was with brought me back. And for three years, I worked in like a state-of-the-art uh, multimedia production center, learned how to edit video and got out in 89 thinking, the world's my oyster, but it didn't quite work out that way, um, <laughs> moving into the civilian world. So I know that you're really big on um, relationship building with your clients. Um, how do you think that factors into what you've done overall, how you've gotten to where you are? And also what relationships did you start to foster when you did go off into the civilian world? It took me a while to get traction. Um, I spent a year doing construction labor after I got out of the military in 89. It wasn't until about 90 that I got my first TV production job uh, as a director, directing morning news and a little bit of voiceover on the side. I knew that the VO thing was kind of cool, but other than radio at the time in 1990, I, I had no idea that there was anything other than radio. Um, <clears throat> uh, progress fast forward into the next stage of, of the post-military stuff. For nine, almost 10 years, I worked for a, a utility company, a big utility company in South Carolina, mm -hmm. doing video production and voiceover work. And so I, I began to understand the potential for voiceover work. And, and then another gig later on is just a video editor. Uh, Rolf, really fast forward to 2012 to get to the, to the answer to your question. Um, all along the way, I mean, I, I, I looked at the people that I admired and that I considered mentors, not necessarily in voiceover, but in the media production field. Mm -hmm. And the people that had the most success, it was obvious. And I was raised this way too, um, to just have good manners, to show graciousness, to be thankful, to have what I call a gratitude attitude, um, and, and just treat people with the utmost respect and, and, and make them enjoy working with you. And, and to me, that seemed like, kind of a no-brainer that's just how you treat people but you know that's not always you know the way you know the business world works yeah. because in media you come in contact with all different kind of um business you know uh, companies and, and career fields but you know i was fortunate enough to work with some really amazing people that helped me grow and that uh, i've tried to do the same thing you know, with um lesser experienced people will ask me you know, what did you do? How did you do it? You know, what's the basic tenet of trying to build a successful business or to be, just be successful in any field you're in, if it's media or otherwise. And the first thing I will tell them is to be nice to people and be gracious to people and be thankful for anybody willing to extend a hand to help you with not, with no agenda. Uh, they're just there because they like to help other people along the way. And I think because I've been in contact with people like that throughout my career, it's fostered in me that idea that it's just, it just makes good sense and it's just the right thing to do. In 2012, when I, when I was totally on my own after I got laid off because the business shut down and the, the video production or the video editing job I had, uh, the last one, uh, I basically took, I basically was just trying to figure out what to do. Voiceover seemed like the, the natural progression of things because I only had so much money to invest in gear. I had an ice Mac. I could do video production. I could do it on the side. I did do it on the side. I had a camera that I bought. I could do that on the side, but I found that the, the, the voiceover was such a, a 
a faster track to get things going as far as, you know, do the job, get paid for the job. There's not a lot of variables. It's either right or it's not. Video, it's, it's such a longer process and there's so many variables and so many things a client can find, you know, that it's, you know, this needs to be tweaked or that needs to be tweaked. Mm -hmm. While I didn't have all the answers on how to start a voiceover business, I knew that the basic principles and they continue to be with the way I run the business is just to treat people right, treat people with respect, uh, reach out to them, be extra gracious. Um, I, I think a couple of years ago, I started sending out these like gift boxes or gratitude boxes to the clients that had been with me for a long time. Um, even, the, even the service industry folks that have nothing to do with media production, I made a decision to, uh, to thank them for them allowing me to be able to do what I do. And I'm talking about um, it may seem odd, but these people help support me so I don't have to be down or be away from the studio. I sent boxes to my uh, auto mechanic. I sent boxes to my tax accountant. I sent gratitude boxes to uh, my dentist. I sent gratitude boxes um, to several other people um, that weren't related to making me money, but they allowed me to do what I do uh, right. easier, you know. You know, right. keeping my teeth healthy, keeping my vehicle running, you know, keeping my taxes straight. Don't do your own taxes. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. And I've, I'm not saying there was a degree of, you know, extra thankfulness, but uh, it saved me a, a good bit of headache, not having to deal with the IRS and just going, here, what do you want? What do you just take these and let me pay you for whatever it's worth. So a, a gratitude attitude is really um, obviously delivering, you know, excellent work and learning your craft and doing that and getting all the technical part worked out and having some sense of uh, the ability to promote yourself or you know, to have good demos and things like that that other voice actors do. Uh, education, I mentioned that, but just being a good person, um, just going by that idea that um, everybody that comes in contact with you, um, you're not using them to get to somewhere else. You're nurturing that relationship right then and there. And I've had some amazing clients I've worked with over the years, Andrew, that since I started this thing that still call on, all on, call on me to do work. Um, and when I develop a relationship, I like to keep it, keep it going, just keep fostering it and just keep building on it. And as time changes, if their business changes, trying to figure out what that means for me to help them solve their solutions. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's completely about customer service and, and just, just being, uh, being grateful for, for having the work because right. they have a lot to choose from in this, in this, in this day and age. There's a lot of people doing what we do. So you have to find ways to stand out. And for me, that's just something I focus on. So what lured you to get away from everything else and take that leap to take that risk of, I want to be my own boss and I want to be my own business owner. It, it wasn't like I woke up one day, uh, the day after I got laid off. I found out that my boss came in and I, on October 1st, I remember it distinctly. There's certain things you never forget. October 1st of 2012. And he walked in and it was a short conversation. And I remember walking out feeling like I'd never been physically shot. I'd never been in a fight where somebody punched me in the gut. But yeah. that's as close as, that is as close as I can come to trying to describe what that felt like. And so I... I, I had no idea. I was totally floored. And I remember walking, vaguely remember walking around this city park just in circles for a couple of hours trying to figure out what I was going to do. Uh, just like, you know, deer in the headlights kind of thing. And a short time after that, thank God, uh, I'm a Christian. So I relied on my faith and relied on friends helping me through this, um, that I was able to kind of shift out of that mode of, of fear and uncertainty into, okay, I need a plan. Uh, I, I, I have skills, uh, I, you know, I have abilities, um, I have a little bit of savings set aside, what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. And so between October and December of 2012, I made that decision, okay, I've gotta do something. I've got some vacation savings. I'm gonna buy a new Macintosh computer. And that didn't seem logical at the time, mm -hmm. but I really felt led to, get my ammo together or get my tools ready for whatever was coming. Um, thankfully that the, the, the employer I left, we left on good terms. So they sent me a lot of freelance work for like six, eight months after that. So that was a good bridge. Oh, that's but it great. wasn't, enough to, 
but it wasn't enough to pay the mortgage. And, you know, I, I, I had this habit of eating. And, <laughs> and so between the bills and, right. and the appetite, you know, it was, and, and there was a big mortgage. So you know, it, it was, it was not a good situation. So, um, so it was a slow process of figuring out, okay, what do I do? So I bought a, a new Mac. I bought a blue mm -hmm. Yeti USB mic. And I had no clue as to, I, I'd been in studios before, but I had no clue as to how to rig up a home studio. I had the stuff sitting in a dining room with 10 foot ceilings with no acoustical treatment whatsoever. And I started looking, first place I found work was on elance.com, which eventually got gobbled up by, I think it was Odesk, which then became Upwork, if you're familiar with that. I am. Um, okay. But at the time, Elance, I put all my eggs in there because I didn't know where else to look. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started booking small jobs and then started booking a few more. The sound quality, I listened back to it now. I've still got some old samples from, from back then. They were atrocious. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could speak and make words goodly, but it was, it was the sound. It was like echoey, 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 echoey. It was like you know, just walking to any bathroom, kitchen, or wherever, and, the, and it was just bouncing all over the place. And I'm, I'm thinking, but they're hiring me to do these little jobs. So as I went, I began to learn. I began to watch YouTube videos. But it really wasn't until probably a couple of years into that kind of making just enough to get by with smaller gigs um, that I started to think, you know, this could actually be something. You know, I'm enjoying the freedom of this. For the first uh, 40 years of my work life, now 35 years of my work life, um, in up to 2012, I was always hired. I worked for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I never had a, you know, a, an overwhelming desire to want to go out and do my own business because I had good paying jobs. And, and, and so you assume it's always going to be there. And that's a big mistake. Right. Um, right. I wasn't prepared, but when I was thrust into it, um, I, I began to learn as I went and so it was a couple of years in, about 2014, 2015, I said, you know, this, this could be something. In the meantime, I had a few job interviews for video editor, video, video editor positions. One, they flew me out to Birmingham and said, we're going to pay you a lot of money. And all you can do is sit here all day and do cookie cutter car advertisements, edit them. And I, on the surface, it, it, was, it was a foolish move to go, no, that's not what I want to do. But as I, was, as I was flying back from Birmingham to Columbia in South Carolina, where I'm at, um, you know, things were starting to turn in, in the direction with the voiceover business. It was starting to get more profitable. Mm -hmm. I was making more per gig. I was learning. I had upgraded my mic. I had begun to learn a little bit more about, it, about treating an area. Um, I was using different software. I was getting better at the craft. I was learning things on YouTube. And... Um, it was at a point in time where it was like a very big crossroad for me. And, and I had to make that choice to say, am I going to take this serious? Am I going to do this seriously? Am I going to go with the voiceover thing that I've been doing? Like, you know, this is a, uh, a freelance thing. It's, it's not a business. Or am I going to go back to what I know, but work for somebody else? And I had to look at the freedom I had as a self-employed freelancer, or I wasn't calling myself self-employed at the time. I was just waiting for the next, for my first, you know, for the real job to show back up. Right. And it was at that point in probably 15 that I decided 2015, I think I can do this full time. So I began to immerse myself and, and watch a lot of uh, videos from a guy named Bill DeWeese, who, uh, you know, was known all over the place as like so many people's mentors. And it turns out later, several years later, he would actually produce my commercial and e-learning narration demo which was a crazy circle of like, you know, watching him and being kind of like, oh man, this guy knows so much. I'm learning so much from him. Finally ended up paying him to do my demo years later. Uh, it wasn't until, I want to say 2015, 2016, that I started to look at what I was doing as a business and actually approaching it as like, I need to market. I need to put stuff on social media. I need to get some demos produced. Because up until that time, I was doing a DIY, a DIY demo. Is that DIY? Yeah. Uh, did my own. And that was not a good thing to do. But it, it booked me a few gigs. And it got me noticed enough to where, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, with a more practice and a better demo, I can do this. So 
I didn't know voiceover coaching even existed. And it wasn't until I had my first commercial demo produced um, in 17 or 18 that I realized having a coach help me through the demo process, um, how, how beneficial that could be. Um, I've taken some classes since then, but for the most part, it's basically self-taught. Um, the commercial work, the narration, the e-learning, uh, just simply having a passion to do that kind of work. Kid stories, character voices for some indie video games, just all over the, all over the spectrum, IVR phone work, uh, anything and everything, not really feeling the need to specialize, but just um, having fun with the whole process, to be honest with you. Um, I do kind of like e-learning and, and kid stories, so if, if I had to pick two. So yeah, those two. I think everybody books their um, of the bulk of their work from like one specific place, just because you have certain tones. Like um, for me, I do um, a lot of animation work and I do a lot of video game work. But outside of that spectrum, a majority of what I get is e-learning and uh, audiobooks because of the way that I enunciate. And so that's where figuring out where your voice fits in with someone else's branding comes in handy. So what do you, what do you enjoy doing the most? Which, which jobs do you enjoy doing the most? Like, which ones are you just like, yes, I got another one. Like, <laughs> Uh, I get excited every time I get a script or I would get to work with a new client, but I will tell you that e-learning gets me uh, jazzed and it, it sounds kind of nerdy, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's, it's a challenge because I, I do a lot of e-learning work um, for a lot of the same companies over and over and over again. So I'm familiar over time with the kind of subject matter, the kind of way, the, the way the team writes, um, the way the individual designers kind of approach it if I need to tweak or proof it a little bit because it's not a hundred percent, you know, exact and I can kind of get it when it's not. Um, I like to break it down to make it conversational. I mean, I like, I like that challenge of getting e-learning script and, and flying through it and scanning through really as fast as I get the script, I will stop what I'm doing and they'll send me, you know, several thousand words and I'll just scan through the PDF document and I'll find a couple acronyms I don't know, or I'll find some weird, you know, uh, in industry term that, that you know, <clears throat> they have to look up themselves and I send it back to them and ask. So it's that challenge of getting that. Um, I get a kick out of uh, a commercial work when, when they send me uh, 100 and plus words for a 30 second spot <laughs> and they say, can you make that work? And I'm like, absolutely, I can make that work. <laughs> and I'm not the fastest reader, in, you know, by any stretch, but there's things you can do in, in the editing process. Uh, to get things, you know, whittled down enough to where it's just barely going to fit. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, how'd you get those 10 pounds into that five pound sack? It's like a lot of practice, a lot of practice and uh, secret sauce. You never tell me exactly what you're doing. You know, trying to find the words that, you know, in shorter scripts anyway, uh, that really need emphasis. I, I find that exciting. Kid stories, I mentioned children's stories where I get to just go absolutely bonkers creatively with character voices or uh, just bringing to life. Uh, I, I had a client hire me to do, I think it's it's up to 16 stories now. Uh, a company that started in New Zealand, they found me, I think it was on Elance uh, seven or eight years ago, seven years ago, I think it was. Um, and we continue to work together. And they started out, they were just, it was called Bible Pathway Adventures. And they, they wanted to just do um, uh, just, it was kind of a test thing. They wanted to put audio in because it was more illustrations and um, games and things like that for the kids. And then the first voiceover I did, I thought, you know, maybe I'll throw in, because it had, you know, it was rich in Bible history and characters. I think it was, it may have been, um, I think it was the story of David and Goliath. So I was having a lot of fun with Goliath, you know, doing all this stuff, playing with it, you know, the pitch uh, control in Adobe yeah. Audition and adding, I added, you know, some sound effects. And then I put some dramatic cinematic music in there. And then, you know, the battle scene and, and, and the crashing of, you know, the giant and all this and the clanking of the swords and the battle. And just, I brought it completely to life. And that just doing the full mix of something like that just was such a thrill. And knowing that it how it was used and how it was distributed, and then we would end up doing 15 more stories over the years, and we're continuing to do them. Um, 
that that just stirs me up to be able to do a full mix to basically the the full audio tapestry as i call it when you're looking at your timeline and it's like 10 12 you know tracks deep and you're and you're going and you're listening back to it and, and you're not going oh i sounded good you know you're listening to the whole thing later the second or third time back to make sure everything's good and you're thinking man that really sounded good when it's all mixed together it's just like you put all those pieces together and that that's a big kick for me so e-learning kids stories uh you know finding unique ways to to do commercials if if it looks like it's not going to quite make it on time um but those things those things uh give me a spark all the stuff I do. I mean, if I get phone messages, I'm still thinking I'm representing this person's business. This is a big deal for them. These Somebody's going to call and they're going to get an impression. And I think we talked about this before. Mm-hmm. You, they, they are trusting you to be the voice or the sound or the reputation or the feeling that someone gets when they pick up the phone and they call and they can't get somebody, but it's going to voicemail or to their after hour messages and you are that identifier. You are that brand. You are bringing it as far as being professional and authoritative. Or I've had people uh, say, you know, we want this. What's the hardware store? We want it kind of blue collar and laid back. So I'll just go into this. All right. Well, here we go. Welcome to calling for, you know, uh, whatever hardware store. We're doing this. Uh, we got a special going on right now. And I, I look as if I'm just looking at you and talking to you. I'm not going, thank you for calling the hardware store. You've reached us after hours. <laughs> You know, it, it's a totally different vibe. And thankfully, the, most of the e-learning I do is very similar to that. It's very, uh, you mentioned Texas before. One of the biggest uh, e-learning clients I have is, is based in Texas. And their target audience are, are people that work in, in, the, in the gas pipeline industry. And these are, these are, these are men and women, um, I just want to call them strong, you know, uh, blue collar workers. Um, and I think about those target audiences, um, that I'm talking to. And so you're always trying to, I try to imagine who I'm talking to and kind of tailor it in that direction. Um, they're intelligent, but they don't want the strict, you know, reading off regulations like this. They want you to look at it. So you're familiar enough with it to go, you're reading it like this and you're explaining it to them and you want to be careful out there guys and and ladies, you just, it's a different vibe. So that, E-learning is not as structured, I think, as it once was. And especially when the client understands that and they're like, you know, be conversational, be real, be, be, be genuine. Uh, don't be so boxy sounding or so um, like they got somebody, just anybody to do it. Uh, and that's why they hired me to do it, you know, so, so I could interpret that and make it sound conversational and um, to make sure that, you're not putting them to sleep. So uh, that's always a challenge, especially with like a nine or 10,000 word script. Right. It's, it, can, it can be a challenge. But so, those things are what I really like. So when you're talking to a new potential client, how do you help them to perceive that value of, um, of that? Because they already have, a lot of businesses already are, know the value of their branding, but how do you convince them that you're the branding that they want? If that makes I think sense. it starts, with, it does, it does make sense. It's like, how do you convince them that what they've got, they need something better? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, that, that it, it's good. But first off, I, I never try to kind of do hard sell with them. Mm-hmm. If we can't just have a conversation, you know, I've, I've had clients contact me on LinkedIn, just they, they would cold, cold call me. I'm not a big one for reaching out and cold calling. I will send emails to prospects if I see, you know, they're in a similar industry or they would be an interesting client to work with or I've seen their stuff and it's like, I'd like to be part of that. But I've had clients call me and we were basically, they were interviewing me for feeling me out. You know, it's like, well, uh, you know, what makes you different or what makes you special or what makes you stand out? And I will just tell them quite honestly, I care about what I do. I care about your business. I care about communicating to the people that you are talking to and trying to train whether it's uh, something legal thing they have to do or if it's a life and death big deal they have to know because it's a safety related thing or if it's just how to use a computer you know a piece of software they've got and they're bringing it into the company and this is like they got to get it done fast um it runs a gamut um the basic thing is just establish that rapport with them 
to let them know that you genuinely care about their industry or their what their objective is or find out what their problem is that needs to be solved. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as saying, you know, what is it that I can do for you that's not being done right now? Um, and just letting them know. And then following up with just outrageous, outrageous fast uh, delivery and customer service and asking the right questions and proofing the script uh, to where there's, you know, if you find something that's a little bit off the punctuation or the grammar or something, you just fix it. You don't, you don't, you don't email them every time once you've got, you know, the business there. You don't email them and tell them, well, I found this and this and this and this and this, because why would you do that? It's like, if it's, if you can read it and you understand you need to tweak it or change it, just do it. And I think that endears you to them even more once they see that you care that much about the process and about the message. And then, uh, and then if you're following up with, with great audio and you're following up with, with a caring attitude and it's, it's all that rolled into one, but getting your foot in the door, obviously, they don't know who you are and you could say you care and you could say, you know, you, you want the best for their business and they're thinking, you know, is this a script or is this, you know, not. Right. If, if they can understand that you're being actually genuine and you are actually genuine about it, then I think that comes through. But it, 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 it all boils down to they, they got to like you. They've got to like working, the prospect of working with you. They can listen to your demos. They can hear the client list you've worked with. Um, you can do samples for them. But it's still a leap for them because they're, a lot is riding on this. And uh, I've uh, several times I would just do almost like a demo or an audition to say, just send me something and let me do it for you. No charge. Let me see how that plugs in with, with your instructional designers for e-learning specifically. You know, plug it in, see how that works. Uh, do you want MP3? Do you want Wave? Are there certain specs? That's my dog's. I apologize for that. <laughs> I left the door open on my studio. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Um, but. They only do this when I'm doing a live or doing a live or a Zoom or something like that. Right. Uh, I think they know. So it it, it ultimately it, it comes down to just building that relationship and showing you, showing them that you're genuine, that you care, and uh, and it's not an act. Uh, that's it's really no more complicated than that for for me, and and that works for, for me. And then after the fact, you treat them like gold. I mean, these people, uh, like I said, we talked about this before. They have a lot of options to choose from. They could get it done in-house probably. And I've, I've seen groups transition to that more and more uh, saying, you know, well, here's a cost cutting thing. We'll, we'll get somebody to do it in-house. And the last thing you want to do if they're doing that is to go, you know, come on, I can do a lot better than that. You don't want to cop, cop that arrogant, <laughs> arrogant attitude. That's the last thing you want to do. Right. You know, if you can do it better than that, then have them send you the script and, and don't say anything else. Say, would you allow me to send you a sample of, of that project I heard? And would, would it be too much trouble to plug that in and listen to it? To just, you know, uh, let me see what I can do for you. No charge. And um, sometimes it's, it's good enough to where, well, let's take a chance on this. And sometimes it's, um, you sound great, but it's just not in the budget. At that point you go, great. You know, and if it's at some point it is, you know, please keep my contact information. Just shoot them an email you know, not to badger them, but just thanking them, send them something, whether it's a mug or um, a thank you card or something, just to let them know you appreciate them and that you're not a jerk and you're walking away, well, fine, I don't need you, either. you know, that kind of dumb stuff like that, or just cut off all contact. You put them in the mailing list, you contact them to make sure everything's cool, you check in, check in on them, check in, check in on them and, um, and go from there and then move on. Uh, it may circle back around. So it's relationships. It's definitely relationships. Right. So what, um, other than the relationship side of it, what um, tool do you think helped you along the way to get this far? Like, was it the military side of it? Was it the broadcast side of it? Was it the getting your commercial coaching? Like, what, what do you think helped you to be able to deliver that message in a way where it's relatable to their audience and figuring out who their audience is. I think it's a combination of, of those things you said. It's, it's, it's the education process. It's the practice. It's the, it's, it's learning over time. It's, it's watching other people do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's listening to mentors that, 
really get it, that are genuine, that are teaching something, but they're also making money doing voiceover at the same time. They're not just, you know, teaching without doing. But I think just uh, the, the practice part of it is huge. Just, you know, you, you get enough years and you start to learn, well, that didn't work. Let me do this. Well, being nice is always going to be a good thing to do, but you got to back that up with, you know, fast customer service. You got to figure out solutions sometimes when your stuff breaks. You got to have backup stuff ready to plug in. You know, you've got to have a plan B when plan A falls apart. You know, we were talking about this before uh, on a, a live Zoom session or a live Skype session or recording session. If something breaks or, you know, falls apart, you've got to have something to go back to. Um, and you've got to be flexible. You've got to be extremely sensitive to the client's schedule and the time zones involved. Because I work with people, and you probably do too, all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do, now there are limits. I mean, I'm not going to get up at two o'clock in the morning because, you know, somebody over on the other side of the world is, you know, it's two o'clock in the afternoon there. There is a limit, you know, because you have a life. But you work out a convenient time. You know, if they're in Europe and it's seven hours ahead, then you say uh, on the East Coast, then you say, oh, well, let's work it out at like uh, nine or 10 in the morning. So that's like later in the afternoon for them. So it's convenient. It's all about making sure you're flexible because it's not, you know, you're, we know we don't work for just local clients or just people right. in the U.S. So you've got to have that flexibility. So flexibility, learning, experience, um, you know, education, um, with a good coach is big, but some, one of the coaches I work with um, kept saying, you can only get so much coaching. And ultimately what it comes down to is you've got to find your voice. I mean, your natural speaking voice is what most people want to hear. They don't want the hype unless it's for a special project. You're doing an announcer thing on purpose. Right. Most of the projects you're doing, you've got to get comfortable with knowing what your normal speaking voice is. And that coach was basically, they were saying, you know, this is what books national jobs. This is what books repeat clients that you just being, you don't have to put on anything and remember what you did the last time, you know, unless it's a, a character. Mm -hmm. But if you're just doing your natural thing, then you find the, the, you find ways to bring it down or bring it up as far as emotion for what the script calls for. And so I think that was really the last coaching I got because it, it, it brought it all together. It's like I could keep learning and keep getting coaching. And I'm not saying that it's not the right thing for some people, but for me, it's like, okay, I know in my head what I need to do. You know, I know the mechanics of, of making this stuff come out normally, uh, depending on how many syllables we're talking about. Uh, I avoid medical e-learning at all, at all costs. I don't do that. <laughs> uh, I, it scares me when I see that, you know, the, the, the long words. Right. Um, it's right. just not worth it. But everything else is like the mechanics are there. You know, the feeling is right. You're not pushing it. You're, you're not, you're not forcing it out. You're not announcing. You're not, you're not, you're just telling a story and it, it's, it, it should be a really natural thing. If you've done it enough times and you're comfortable hearing yourself and you know the copy, then it, it, it's, it's really, it's, we got a good job, man. We got a seriously good job. We got a really good job. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. we are very blessed to be able to do what we do. I, I, right. I, 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 it never fails to amaze me and, and make me appreciate how blessed I am. Two things when I'm well, in the summertime in South Carolina, watching construction workers, God bless them. Nothing against, con, against construction workers, but I would not want to be in a hundred degree heat in a pit or on a road crew right. doing that. It's like when I come in my studio it's like, oh my goodness, I get to do this for a living. People want me to talk in a padded room. This is a good gig. And the other thing is, if if I happen to be out and see rush hour traffic coming, you know, and, and it's like four lanes of traffic backed up, I'm like, I don't have to do that. This is my work spot. Uh, and the kitchen's 10 feet that way and the bathroom's that way. And just close the door and keep the dogs quiet and happy. And then uh, I can do my thing. And so... Yeah, I, I never take it for granted uh, to be able to do what I do. Super blessed. Super Man. blessed. So you, you've you obviously learned so, I mean, in 30 years, you've learned so much about the industry. And if you if you were to write yourself a letter to yourself when you when you first started in the industry, what, what, what would that letter say to your past self? 
Hmm. Well, that came out of left field. <laughs> what would I say? <laughs> I, I, that, that's one of those. Uh, hmm, let me see. Wise guy with a pipe. <laughs> uh, what would I? What would I write to myself? Yeah. Uh, learn more early on. Uh, don't think you know. Uh, don't rely on the fact that you are self-taught and that you can teach yourself how to do things. Rely on people and and pay for the training early on, so you move along faster on the track. And and that part, you know, it, you, you've got a foundation. You you're still yourself, but you have a foundation. Dear Troy, learn quicker, learn from more uh, outside sources. Don't rely on yourself. I tend to be very self-reliant, you know, just like I'll learn it myself. I'll teach that software to myself. I'm not going to read the directions, you know, that sort of stuff. I'll, I'll figure it out as I go. And there's, you can move along faster if you find good trusted people to learn from. So learn earlier. Um, I'm trying to think what else, because the, that process Oh, I know that I know something I've told other people in a different interview was to because the self-reliant kind of isolated thing that I'm that I'm in. I think we can tend to be isolated and not reach out and network with other people, not necessarily classes, but just learning like what we're doing right here on your show. Just learning, you know, from other people from different backgrounds, different ages, you know, I. I'm 57, okay, but I find such gold nuggets sometimes talking to people in their 20s and 30s of coming up in this business. And it's like, I had no idea how to do that. I had no idea. So that old dog, new trick kind of thing, mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in that. So learning is such a key thing. So I'm writing this letter to me. I'm going, buddy, you better learn from some of the best early on. Ask questions. Don't be shy. Network with people. Uh, get out there and 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 learn more about the marketing aspect of the business. Oh, and by the way, in 20 years, there'll be a thing called Facebook and Instagram. Invest in that. <laughs> <laughs> because back then, you know, the letter. Right. Uh, but, you know, but uh, those kind of things there. And I'm a big believer in, in social media, too. I do a lot of that uh, just to for awareness and presence sake, just just to put stuff right. out there. So, uh, yeah, but that would be the that would be the gist of the letter. Learn and network and uh, make more connections and I'd be further along than I am now because to be honest, I've only been doing this part of it for eight years, uh, nine this year, um, but because I was relying on other people and other businesses to get me you know, to where I'm at, but it, obviously I learned some, something about voiceover, but it wasn't until the eight year crash course <laughs> of having to do it as a business, you know, that's when it kind of, hush puppy, that sounded odd. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what the gist of the letter. That's what it would be. Just uh, wise up and uh, reach out. I really hope you enjoyed hearing Troy talk about how a man from any walk of life can fall in love with the beauty of storytelling and foster that love through simple acts of kindness. If you'd like to know more about him, you can check out his demos, work, and more at www www.troywhudson.com Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com